On the glittering streets of Las Vegas, ruthless gunmen overpower defenseless victims and haul away a motherload of cash. Following a trail from exotic dance clubs to the tranquil suburbs, authorities finally put down the reckless robbers. But a daring jailbreak leads the FBI to a violent showdown with a man so desperate that he'll risk his own family to get what he wants. Las Vegas, a gang of robbers target an ATM repository and hit the jackpot. They take over a million dollars in cash, the largest heist in Las Vegas history. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The robbery was well planned and precisely executed. The FBI and local police struggled to identify and track a desperate criminal whose tendency for violence turned a robbery into a case of murder. Las Vegas, a gambler's paradise, where even criminals sometimes try their luck. On the night of December 21st, 1998, a Las Vegas couple and their 18-year-old sister-in-law prepare to go to work. The family owns a janitorial service that cleans commercial buildings. Suddenly, Two masked gunmen rush up and force them inside their own van. Get in there! For the cleaning crew, an ordinary workday has just become a night of terror. The gunmen blindfold and tie up their three captives. Oh, shut her up! What are you looking at? Sit! Sit still! Sit still! Don't move! They can hear the gunman talking to a female accomplice on a radio. Go, let's go. Car two, are you in position? The gunman seemed to know the janitor's routine. They drive around until 11 p.m., the time they are scheduled to begin work at the Bank of America building. The gunmen even park where the janitors routinely park go. their van. Let's go. Your feet down. Let's go, girl. Get out of here. Next. The building is Bank of America's central ATM repository in Las Vegas. Let's go. Cash from 1,200 automated teller machines, often totaling more than a million dollars, is delivered there each night. The gunmen force the janitors to use their key card and access code to unlock the door. This bypasses the bank's alarm system. Get in here. The gunmen release the couple and order them to clean the building as they normally would. Turn around. Look. Get out they keep there. the wife's sister hostage to ensure the couple complies with their orders. She is dead. You hear me? She's dead. Act like you're clean. Get out! Now! Get out! At 11.30 p.m., an armored car arrives to pick up the night's cash deposit. Following a standard security protocol, the two guards first call the bank security company to ask if there have been any unauthorized entries. Uh, we're checking out the parking lot, the only thing... The alarm company reports that the only people inside are the janitors. The only vehicle the guards see in the parking lot is the janitor's van.
inside, everything seems completely normal. The janitors are too terrified to say anything. The life of an 18-year-old girl is at stake. The guards open the vault containing $1,088,000 shrink-wrapped and ready for pickup. Suddenly... Get down! Get down! Get on the floor! Get your hands up! As the gunmen disarm the guards... Two guards, I'll stay down. One of them accidentally discharges his weapon. Come on, let's The bullet go. ricochets off the floor and hits one guard in the chest. Come on, let's go! Guards calls for an ambulance. Well, my partner's down. He's been shot. I need an ambulance quick, please. Oh. Please. FBI Special Agent Henry Schlumpf arrives at the scene. He heads the investigation. Everybody was very scared. And, uh, you know, it took a little while to calm everybody down and to get a story as to what exactly happened. And the descriptions that we got because the subjects were masked were very general in nature. We were looking for two males who were either white, black, or Hispanic, uh, six foot, six foot three, and about 200 pounds. That was basically all the description that we had. With little to go on, every detail is important. The janitors told us that when the subjects first entered the bank, they were a little taken aback at the number of video cameras that were in the bank. That indicated to us that they had not been inside before. This suggests that the robbery may not have been an inside job. Agents interview a truck driver who witnessed the robbers leaving the depository. The truck driver was making a late night delivery to a nearby store. He saw two men run out of the depository and throw some bags in the back of a white Chevy S10 pickup truck. And they just took off in that direction. Authorities begin searching for the getaway truck. I put out uh, the announcement for all responding units to look for a white Chevy S10 pickup truck. It wasn't very long after that the vehicle was found about a quarter of a mile from the depository and just parked on a residential street. Investigators run the truck's plates. Ironically, the truck is a police maintenance vehicle that was stolen from a Las Vegas Metro police lot one week earlier. Investigators begin questioning neighbors, including a woman whose home is closest to where the truck is parked. She hadn't seen anybody get out of the pickup truck, but earlier in the evening, there had been another truck parked in the same place. And she described that as a white GMC Dually, which is a pickup truck with four wheels on the back axle. Agents believe the woman saw the robbers switch vehicles, a common MO for bank robbers. They issue an APB for the white GMC truck. Hours later, they receive the welcome news that the wounded guard has undergone surgery and will survive. The next day, the bank determines that a total of $1,088,000 has been stolen. To date, it is the largest bank robbery in Las Vegas history. Although FBI agents believe this was not an inside job, they cover all their bases by interviewing the armored car guards and all bank employees. We didn't have a lot to go on. We ended up interviewing everybody who worked at the branch and everybody who worked at the armored car company and polygraphing some of them. Although agents do not find any new information, they do rule out the employees as suspects. Thank you. The subjects who committed the robbery could have found out everything they needed to find out by following the armored truck around and following the guards around. And we surmised early on that that's probably exactly what they did. 
With the investigation running out of leads, executives from Bank of America and the Armored Car Company decide to offer a reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the robbers. Agent Schlumpf advises them on how large the reward should be. And I said $50,000, which was quite a lot for a bank robbery, but we were gonna need to generate some public interest in this case. Agents ask local authorities for their cooperation. We notified the airport that we were looking for someone carrying large amounts of money. Uh, we notified all the jails uh, to advise us if anyone tried to bail someone out with large amounts of cash. A week after the million dollar robbery, the FBI receives a call from security at Las Vegas's McCarran Airport. They got a telephone response from someone asking if large amounts of currency would set off the metal detectors. And they took the number down on caller ID and gave it to us. Investigators use a reverse telephone directory to find the caller's address. Agents set up surveillance on that address, a home in the suburbs of Las Vegas. There were people going in and out of the house about every half hour. Someone would arrive and someone else would leave. But it's curious and, you know, I kind of like to know what's going on. After several hours, agents decide to interview the people in the house. Hello, how are you? I'm Investigator Davis the Las Vegas Police Department. This is Special Agent Reed. Yeah. It was just a uh, piano teacher who was giving half-hour lessons, and uh, she was going to be uh, going to Utah with uh, about $3,000, and so she had called McCarran Airport to find out if that would set off the detectors. The lead is a dead end. Agents are back where they started. But later that day, a woman responding to the reward poster calls the Las Vegas Metro Police. She claims to have key information about the bank robbery. So tell me about this stripper friend of yours. Wow, her name's Jennifer. The tipster tells agents about a dancer she knows who works at a local strip club. Oh, fuzzy bottom, you know, over on table. Her name is Jennifer Arden. She says Jennifer has been spending a lot of cash lately. He was able to give us a telephone number. We traced that number to a rented trailer. The FBI sets up surveillance on the trailer. Agents watch for any clue to the identity of the two gunmen or the location of the stolen million dollars. In a matter of minutes, a white GMC truck pulls into the driveway. It's the same make and model the robbers used as their getaway vehicle. Agents run the license plates. According to the Department of Motor Vehicles, the truck is registered in Las Vegas to Timothy Blackburn. driver enters the house and leaves minutes later. The surveillance team immediately notifies Agent Schlumpf. The sighting of the GMC pickup uh, gave us enough probable cause to get a warrant for the trailer. Moments later, a SWAT team surrounds the trailer. To serve the warrant, we brought a lot of people with us because we knew we were looking for armed and dangerous subjects. They had already shot one person. We knocked on the door of the trailer and nobody answered, so we kicked the door open and served the search warrant. The SWAT team finds one man in the trailer. He identifies himself as Riley Bates. He reveals that Jennifer is his girlfriend. One team of agents begins searching the trailer for evidence, while another heads to the strip club to question Jennifer. FBI, I'd like to ask you a few questions, please. About what? You've been spending an awful lot of money. 
the exact dancer and told us that the money was her money that she had made over the past four years dancing and that she didn't know anything about a robbery or anything else. Back at the trailer, agents continue to search for clues. In the bedroom, they find a heavy-duty combination safe. It looks brand new. The trailer was filled with trash, and it was not the kind of place where you would expect anybody with any money to be living. And yet here they had this brand new safe they had bought. What's the combination? Riley oh, no, claims the girlfriend. safe belongs to his girlfriend, and only she knows how to open it. Agent Durham, I help you? Jennifer. What's the number to the combination of the safe? And the agent trailer? asks Jennifer for the combination. It's not my safe, it's my boyfriend. But it's she not my says safe. Riley has it. Combination? Do you hear that? She said she doesn't know what the combination to the safe is. The safe belongs to her boyfriend. So we go back to Riley Bates and tell him that his girlfriend said he had the combination, so then he told us the combination. Yep, that's it. Inside the safe, the FBI finds $50,000 in cash and bags of marijuana. Riley insists that he made the money by selling marijuana and claims he knows nothing about the robbery. Agents strongly suspect he is lying. But with over a million dollars missing, where is the rest of the money? Las Vegas. December 1998. A team of violent bank robbers shoot an armored car guard and flee with more than a million dollars. A tip leads the FBI to a rented trailer and a brand new safe containing $50,000. Jennifer Arden, an exotic dancer, claims she earned the money dancing. Her boyfriend, Riley Bates, says he made the money selling marijuana. Now agents must find the rest of the money. Over a million dollars in cash. The FBI calls in one of their top interviewers, Special Agent Brett Shields, to try to get the truth from Riley. We tried to remove him from his comfort zone and took him out to my car, where he's a little bit more on edge rather than at the comfort of his own home. Yeah. You're gonna get in a lot of trouble here. Yeah, Riley Bates was a shifty little guy. He knew he was in a, a tough position because we'd found the money in the trailer. He, he tried to maintain that it was profits from the marijuana that was found in the safe. It wasn't believable that uh, he was that successful and he's still living in a single wide trailer. You're gonna be in a lot of trouble here, you know that? We had gotten convinced that we can help him out on the marijuana charges and he doesn't want to get tied up into the million dollar bank robbery. He said, I didn't commit any robbery. So now Agent Shields and I know, you know, we're probably about two questions away from finding out who did. So we said, okay, Riley, you didn't commit the robbery, but I believe you know who did commit the robbery. And he said, my brother Robert and his friend Tim. He's my brother, Tim. Really? Yeah. Well, where is Tim right now? I don't know where they are right now. Riley claims that he doesn't know where his brother Robert is. Where are they? But I don't know where they are. But inside the trailer, agents find gaming chips and receipts from the Luxor, a casino on the Las Vegas Strip. So we sent a couple agents to the Luxor, and they contacted management, and sure enough, Robert Bates was staying there. The hotel's head of security tells agents that Robert Bates has been spending heavily, paying for everything in cash. That's located where, sir? That's in the uh, southeast town. You see the types of items that they're, uh, that they're purchasing. Judging from his guest portfolio at the Luxor, Robert Bates had been just partying constantly since the night of the robbery. The two agents stake out Bates' hotel room until he returns. 
he was on some kind of drugs. There's no point in trying to interview someone uh, if they're if they're stoned on whatever he was on. Inside Bates's hotel room, agents find drugs, a gun, and five thousand dollars in cash. With nearly a million dollars still missing, agents now concentrate on the second suspect named by Riley Bates, his brother's friend, Tim Blackburn. We set up surveillance on Timothy Blackburn's house. So we had police and FBI agents surrounding the house. They decide to approach Blackburn, but proceed cautiously. He's been investigated for armed robbery in the past and is considered highly dangerous. Tim Blackburn was about 26 years old, six foot three, 230 pounds. He was a martial arts expert, and he liked uh, fighting, and he liked guns. He was an accomplished marksman. The FBI's criminal apprehension team moves into position. Special Agent Castle Nishimoto is a member of this elite tactical unit. My job was to watch the streets. I knew he was armed, uh, but I wasn't particularly scared at that point because I felt confident that I would be able to spot him and from where I was watching. The agents were just approaching the house to make contact with the people inside. When a car comes driving down the road, the SUV suddenly accelerates towards the agents. The driver loses control. And the vehicle stops and a man jumps out and runs away. We assumed it was Blackburn who had run out of the car. He was uh, jumping the fence, uh, the walls in the back of the house and so forth, and was trying to get away. And so from that point on, uh, we began to search the area. The driver of the vehicle is Blackburn's sister-in-law. Authorities take her into custody. The FBI and Las Vegas police launch a house-to-house -house search for Blackburn. Two blocks away, a canine unit picks up the fugitive scent. Come out with your hands up! Right, Come on out! Get your hands! The in the door. Come on. Blackburn was found by a canine unit hiding under a deck in someone's backyard. He had a mask and he had an ankle holster. Fortunately for the canine officer, the holster was empty. Blackburn had lost his gun jumping over fences. Investigators searched the suspect's home while agents questioned Tim Blackburn and his wife Sophia. They offer Blackburn a reduced sentence if he will admit to the robbery. If you don't see it, it's not here. He refuses. Investigators continue to search the house. An evidence response search is very methodical. It's not just everybody running around to where they think something might be hidden. Uh, everything is photographed first, and then the search progresses room by room, and then the outside is usually done at the end. They find some flex cuffs, uh, like we're the same type that the janitors had been bound with, and they found some walkie-talkies and some other surveillance equipment. that morning in Blackburn's backyard, they find several duffel bags inside the doghouse. I just couldn't believe that he put the money in the doghouse. Uh, and then on second thought, I thought, well, maybe that might not be a bad place to put the money since nobody looks there. It's just an innocuous place. Investigators recover more than $900,000, 90% of the stolen money. It took about 10 hours to count it. 
So by 4 o'clock that afternoon, you know, we knew we had the money from the Bank of America robbery. The U.S. District Court charges Tim Blackburn and Robert Bates with bank robbery, kidnapping, carjacking, and using a firearm in the commission of a violent crime. They are held at the North Las Vegas Detention Center. But the FBI's work is unfinished. They believe that Blackburn and Bates were not working alone. We knew that there was probably someone else involved in the robbery, that it was too much logistically for only two people to do. You know, your husband was Agents suspect Sophia Blackburn might be involved because her story does not seem credible. I was at the house several times to talk to Sophia Blackburn. Sophia claimed to have no knowledge of the robbery, and in fact, uh, she provided an alibi for Tim Blackburn on the night of the robbery. She said she was with him the whole night. She couldn't account for the money that they found or the other items that were in the house. She was worried because her husband was in jail and she had two young daughters to raise herself. So she was claimed to be cooperative, but she would have these stories that were in no way even close to plausible. But that's what she was going to stick with. And, you know, there was not going to be really any way to talk her out of them. There was no way that she was ever going to give us any information that would implicate Tim Blackburn. On August 11th, 1999, seven months after the million dollar robbery, Sophia visits her husband in jail. You can't tell him where I am. She secretly uses a tiny tool on her keychain to loosen the screw securing the divider window. It's good, so my babies are doing all right. Huh? As the visiting room guard leaves to escort a prisoner. Blackburn removes the bulletproof glass. Tim Blackburn climbed through the window and dived into the sally port. The one door closed and the second door opened before anybody realized what he had done. As soon as the second door opened, he was just climbing over everybody in the sally port and he ran outside. Sophia retrieves a gun she had hidden earlier and tosses it to Blackburn. All the alarms are going off and guards outside knew that there was a jailbreak. As the Blackburns try to get away, they face startled guards violent shootout. August 11th, 1999. Timothy Blackburn, accused of the biggest bank robbery in Las Vegas history, breaks out of jail with the help of his wife, Sophia. FBI Special Agent Henry Schlump. They try to, to arrest Blackburn, but he shoots at them. This pickup truck that's sitting in the lot was going to be his escape vehicle. But the guards are returning fire. Blackburn is forced to abandon the truck. Suddenly, his wife Sophia roars up in an Isuzu rodeo. In a matter of seconds, they are out of range. It was hard to believe that Blackburn had actually escaped from the jail because although a lot of people a lot of people want to escape from the jail, and many attempted, very few actually get away. But it just pointed out again how unpredictable Blackburn was. Looking for leads, FBI agents Henry Schlumpf and Brett Shields tracked down the suspect's relatives. Blackburn was going to have to go someplace to get some help. Agents check out an apartment building where Blackburn's sister-in-law lives. Parked out front, they find the same Isuzu rodeo used in the jailbreak. They run the plates and discover it belongs to Blackburn's wife, Sophia. We see the truck in the parking lot. So now our heart's racing just a little bit more. The adrenaline's pumping. Since he was in federal custody, it falls under the U.S. Marshal's jurisdiction as well. So I called some Marshal friends of mine we're sitting on this truck 
not knowing if he's going to come out back out to this truck and we're going to have a confrontation right there before the marshals get there after a few tense moments u.s marshals arrive to help fbi agents raid the apartment step outside can we go inside search the premises but Blackburn isn't there. Agents ask the fugitive sister-in-law where Tim Blackburn is. She says she doesn't know. This could be extremely they ask why Sophia Susu is there and not her own car, which authorities know is a Nissan Pathfinder. She claims it's in the shop, but her story does not check out. Agents suspect Blackburn is on the run with her Pathfinder. Can you tell us where it is? No, I, I have no idea where it's at. For the next week, the FBI searches for Blackburn, his wife, and their two little girls. They come up empty. Then, nine days after the jailbreak, a Las Vegas police helicopter spots a Nissan Pathfinder parked in the desert family of four is nearby. The FBI and Las Vegas police arrive in force. Now we have no shot. Special Agent Castle Nishimoto leads the FBI SWAT team. We were located on the ridge line, uh, quite a bit above them, and there was a valley between us. We can see some people about half a mile away too far away to identify them. If law enforcement tries to move any closer, they will have to move through an unprotected open space. We had to keep our distance from these people, because if it was Blackburn, he is a marksman. Nevertheless, Agent Schlumpf daringly volunteers to drive down for a closer look. It did take some courage, because the only coverage he had would have been the snipers. And they had at least three or four hundred yards shot, as I recall. As Agent Schlumpf gets nearer, he can finally make out faces. I could recognize that it wasn't Blackbird. It wasn't anybody who we were looking for. Authorities have hit another dead end. But Agent Slump also realizes that authorities cannot continue to respond on such a massive scale. There must have been a hundred vehicles in this valley. All the SWAT vehicles and evidence response team vehicles and police cruisers. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, we, we can't be doing this every time someone says Tim Blackburn. I mean, nobody's got the resources and we're going to burn ourselves out. The next night, law enforcement pursues the dangerous fugitive with every available resource. We had about 40 agents, police, marshals, Henderson Police Department, detention center people. We got everybody together and we divided up into teams. And what we were going to do was interview every one of Blackburn's associates, search every house, find every vehicle that he could possibly have access to. U.S. Marshals tell the FBI they have spotted the fugitive. We arrive right as they're taking down uh, what they believe is Tim Blackburn. I could tell right away it wasn't Tim Blackburn, it was his brother. His brother is a younger, slightly smaller version of Tim Blackburn, very similar in appearance. As we're IDing him, what we notice is that his driver's license was brand new. He had just gotten it the day before. So we asked him, well, what happened to your old license? On the hood. Blackburn's brother claims he lost his license. But agents suspect he gave it to the fugitive to use as a fake ID. In the car, agents find a note from Tim Blackburn. In it, he asks his brother to get him some money. A man who once had a million dollars in his possession now needs a loan to survive. We decided to arrest him for uh, aiding and abetting a fugitive. 
So that's what we did. We arrested Tim Blackburn's brother. Authorities also arrest Blackburn's sister-in-law for lying to federal authorities when she said her Nissan Pathfinder was in the shop. With two of his family members in custody, agents develop an ingenious plan to lure Tim Blackburn into the open. In Las Vegas, a violent bank robber breaks out of jail with the help of his wife. After three days of eluding authorities, agents decide to turn up the heat on the dangerous fugitive. One of the people we wanted to talk to that night was a close friend of Blackburn's who worked as a bouncer at a local gentleman's club. Most people who knew Blackburn either liked him or were afraid of him. And neither opinion was really conducive to providing information to us. His friend was really no exception. He didn't want to tell us anything, but eventually what he told us was that Tim Blackburn had called him at the time he was escaping. Blackburn had called up and said, I'm out, I'm out. And this friend could hear the sirens and stuff in the background. You're the last guy that we know of. So I told this friend, you are the last person who Tim Blackburn talked to that we know about. And I think he's going to call you again. And when he does, we want you to tell him that we've arrested his brother and that the people who have assisted him are going to have to pay for what they did to help him. This putting pressure on Blackburn was an effort to try to get him to realize he couldn't really escape, to, to get him to turn himself in wherever he was at. The next morning, this friend called me up and told me that, sure enough, Tim Blackburn had called him again and that he had told him that I'd arrested his brother and his sister-in-law. And, uh, you know, I asked him what, what did Blackburn say, and he just said he was mad. Two and a half weeks after the jailbreak, FBI agent Henry Schlumpf learns that Blackburn may have returned to Las Vegas. I got a phone call from a Las Vegas SWAT officer. He had just met someone who gave him some information regarding Blackburn's whereabouts in Las Vegas, which to my mind was doubtful. I doubted Blackburn was in Las Vegas. But I told the, I asked the officer to ask this fellow if he knew the names of Blackburn's daughters. And sure enough, this informant did know the names, so at least we knew he did know Blackburn. The informant claims Blackburn is staying at a motel that caters to long-term guests. Agent Slump and two Las Vegas SWAT officers rush to the location. You seen these two before? The manager says he's never seen the Blackburns before and they are not registered at the motel. Still, Agent Schlumpf decides to rent a room so he can surveil the facility. SWAT officers call in the license plates of every vehicle in the parking lot. None of them are reported as either stolen or owned by any of Blackburn's relatives. The motel tip is beginning to look like another false lead. The FBI does not give up. They begin checking every apartment. So what we decided to do was to perform a ruse. We would have a uh, complex security guard just start knocking on doors and uh, notifying the residents of uh, noise complaints. I'm there watching and the door opens and Sophia Blackburn comes out to talk to the guard. I couldn't believe it. There she was. She looked happy and smiling and well rested uh, better than I'd ever seen her. She did not look like she'd been on the run for 17 days. Suspecting that Blackburn is hiding in the apartment, Agent Schlumpf calls for immediate backup. The criminal apprehension team in Las Vegas SWAT arrived within minutes. SWAT responded right away. More agents came. 
and a lot of patrol units, marshals came. And what we did was we started evacuating the complex. Every apartment was evacuated except, of course, for the one where we thought Blackburn might be. And then we did what we do in 99% of our fugitive cases. Our criminal apprehension team placed a call into the apartment. I need to talk to Timothy Blackburn. What they do is they tell the person in there, look, we know you're there, you're surrounded, there's no way that you can get out, so come on out. We just want to find a nice, peaceful way to end this whole thing. So I'm waiting for Blackburn to come out, and I'm deciding, you know, where are we going to take him, back to the jail he escaped from or to a different facility, and that's, that was my mindset. You know, if he was in there, he was going to come out, but he doesn't. Agent Sloan, he wants to the, talk to uh, apprehension team person was on the phone and she says he wants to talk to you. Hello, Tim. And sure enough, it was Tim Blackburn. And my job was just to keep him talking on the phone because as long as he's talking on the phone, he's not shooting anybody. When I first started talking with Blackburn, I had was kind of commiserating with him, telling him, you know, it must have been hard to uh, being on the run for the last three weeks. Hey, I uh, took the kids to San Diego. Have you ever been so to here San Diego? he was, maybe ten How minutes from Mexico, go? and uh, he didn't go there. He came back to Las Vegas. Agent Schlump cannot understand why Blackburn has returned, but is even yeah, more concerned that his children may be with him. Why don't we, uh, why don't we just talk about... Then his worst fears are realized. He hears the two little girls laughing in the background. There's children inside the room. Repeat, there's children inside the room. A SWAT team set up outside the apartment, and they were there to initiate a hostage rescue if Blackburn turned violent and started hurting any of the people in the apartment, Sophia, and their two little girls. He says, Henry, I, I don't suppose you can just let us go. And you know, I told him, you know, you know, I can't do that. I'm not going back to jail, man. I'm not going back to jail. Look, I don't want my kids to visit me in jail. Tim was set on not going back to jail. He, he said he just wasn't going to go back. And you know, after shooting a guard, I mean, there's no way any of that is going to go away. Schlump worries that Blackburn may be suicidal. Hey, Tim, you know, it's time to come in, buddy. Authorities now face a dangerous scenario, a hostage hey. barricade Look. situation Look. involving an armed man, Look. his wife, go, right? and two small children. Look, I'm not going back, man. That's just it. I'm not going back to jail. I'm not going back. The FBI and police SWAT teams surround a motel just off the Strip in Las Vegas. A violent bank robber has barricaded himself inside one of the apartments. I'm not going back, man. Tim Blackburn is armed and emotional. Inside the room with him are his wife, Sophia, and his two daughters. Oh, you came back. FBI agent Henry Schlumpf tries to talk the desperate man into surrendering. So come on out. Although negotiators are present, Blackburn refuses to talk with anyone but Agent Schlumpf, who months earlier had arrested him for bank robbery. I'm not going back to jail, man. I don't want my kids to visit me in jail. Agent Schlumpf pleads with both Blackburn and Sophia to let the children leave the apartment. Slow it all down. Sometimes. I talked with Sophia and sometimes with Blackburn. It seemed like maybe we were getting a little farther ahead talking with Sophia, but then when we take a break and she talked to Blackburn, we kind of have to start over again. He had a lot of influence with her, I mean, because he's her husband. She was afraid that if she were to leave with the children, that Blackburn would kill himself. And, you know, she certainly didn't want that to happen. We'd take breaks, and then I'd call in again. You know, there were highs and lows. Sometimes it seemed like we were making progress. Other times, you know, we took a couple of steps backward. Tim, you know, it's time to come in, buddy. 
So Henry, what's the best place to shoot myself in the head, huh? He asked me what I thought would be the best place for him to shoot himself. And I told him that we had a lot of other things that we could talk about and try to work out before it came to that. How are the kids doing? Blackburn says he put his daughters in the bathtub to protect them. For their own protection. But the SWAT commander is concerned. Confining them could also be the prelude to a murder-suicide pact. The SWAT team prepares to blow the door in case they need to rescue Sophia and the children. The SWAT team placed a explosive charge on the door, an entry charge, to be able to breach the door very quickly uh, if they needed to. After four long hours of negotiation, they had to go clear to the back, into the bathroom, to try and rescue the children. And uh, in this case, seconds, fractions of seconds count. They got there just in time to see Blackburn falling down from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. They find Sophia dead. Both the children have been shot in the head and are barely alive. I saw them running very quickly to try to save the children. The SWAT team got them to the paramedics, but they died in their arms. I felt uh, quite, quite saddened that my fellow uh, SWAT uh, officers tried their best and uh, yet wasn't able to save the children. Our mission was to save lives and we were not able to accomplish that. It was just devastating. It was like the worst possible outcome. later determines that the shots that killed Blackburn, Sophia, and their two little girls were all fired by Blackburn himself. A few months later in federal court in Las Vegas, Riley Bates and his girlfriend plead guilty to possessing stolen money. Because of their cooperation, they are sentenced to only a year. Blackburn's sister-in-law is sentenced to one year for lying to federal agents and impeding their investigation. Robert Bates pleads guilty to bank robbery and is sentenced to 24 years in prison. Today, Agent Henry Schlumpf has made his own peace with the tragic events caused by Tim Blackburn. He's ultimately responsible for everything that happened. He came back to Las Vegas uh, to do exactly what he did. He came back to die. I don't think he was gonna ever come out of that apartment or let anybody else come out of it either. Las Vegas law enforcement will never forget the deaths of two innocent children. For them, the Blackburn case is all about lost hope and the tragedy of a desperate agenda. In Las Vegas, fortunes are won and lost through games of chance, but some try to beat the odds with violence. A ruthless band of vicious thugs strikes several casinos, taking thousands of dollars, leaving a bloody trail in their wake. Local police and the FBI team up to identify and track down the deadly gunman, who will stop at nothing to avoid capture.
kind of story that Hollywood films are made of. Brazen armed robberies of Las Vegas casinos. But this was no movie. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. They were a gang of criminal masterminds. They carried automatic weapons and were not afraid to use them. With each and every new heist, they became bolder and more deadly until the FBI stepped in, determined to end their violent rampage. Las Vegas, Nevada, September 20th, 1998. It is shortly before noon at the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino. Two armed couriers, escorted by an MGM security guard, transport the casino's money toward an exit where an armored truck awaits. Suddenly, two gunmen confront them. One grabs the courier's guns, then snatches three money pouches containing nearly $350,000 in cash. Then the men flee through a side exit. The guards call the Las Vegas police and the FBI. Detectives and agents respond to the casino and interview the guards, who give investigators a rough description of their assailants. Any kind of logo on the jacket? Not that I saw. Okay. It was two, two Latinos. Okay. I think they were pretty sure it was What kind of guns were they? They were, uh, not the, the robbers guard. left no physical evidence at the scene. Right. Two semi-automatic weapons. Right. I mean, they were standing, like, right here, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The MGM, like all Las Vegas casinos, has a vast network of security cameras. FBI agents review video of the crime. Special Agent Henry Schlump observes the way the lead gunman brandished his weapons, which suggests he could be a dangerous individual. Seeing a subject commit a robbery with a gun in each hand is not typical. That would be a rare occurrence. And I think it would uh, portend the violence that the subject was capable of. We got two fisted guns left. Okay, can you give me the outside tape? They go directly out to the sidewalk and down the street. Agents also watch footage captured by the hotel's exterior cameras, which reveals that the robbers fled across the street toward a neighboring hotel. Investigators go to the Hotel San Remo and review surveillance video from their exterior cameras. They see the robbers get into a pickup truck driven by a third man. But the video cannot provide a viable lead, according to FBI Special Agent Castle Nishimoto. The uh, quality of the film wasn't as such that we could make out exactly uh, the numbers on the plates. We had a few partials on the numbers, but we couldn't uh, uh, see the whole plate. We could only read the first three numbers, but we couldn't get the uh, three alphabet letters after that. Despite having only a general description, police begin searching for the getaway truck. However, they are unable to immediately find it. Nearly two months later, continued search efforts lead to a break in the case. Once again at the San Remo. In the casino's parking lot, a Las Vegas Metro Police detective locates what looks like the getaway truck. The truck's plate numbers match the partial numbers seen on the surveillance tape. To investigators, it seems the robbers waited for the heat to die down after the robbery, then drove the getaway truck back to the San Remo. The detective runs a check on the vehicle's identification number and discovers it was reported stolen almost three weeks before the MGM robbery. 
Running a check on the license plate, investigators find it was stolen from a disabled car kept at a Las Vegas storage area. Can I help you? Yes, sir. The manager of the facility tells the Las Vegas Metro Police detective he knows nothing about the theft. He suggests he speak to the watchman who lives at the storage area, Jose Vigoa. The manager points out Vigoa in the distance. The detective asks the manager to have the watchman contact him, but Vigoa never calls. Months pass, and the investigation runs out of leads. June 28, 1999, nine months after the MGM robbery, at the Desert Inn Casino, an armored van is making its rounds collecting cash. Two gunmen confront the guards. The guard inside the van is hit in the arm. His partner returns fire, but is hit three times in the leg. Through their training, the guards know to aim for the chest. Their bullets slam into the gunman, but the shots fail to stop them. They must be wearing body armor. The guard on the ground manages to get to the safety of the armored vehicle. Van's driver heads to a nearby hospital. Both guards survive the gun battle. Within minutes, Las Vegas police and the FBI converge at the Desert Inn. A casino employee tells investigators she saw the gunman flee the scene in a light-colored SUV, and police put out an alert. FBI Special Agent Richard Beasley studies the crime scene. My initial impression was that it was uh, a very bold attempt to take an armored car. Uh, these guys weren't uh, afraid to use the firepower that they had with them. There was uh, a number of brass casings in one area, and then there were brass casings uh, in the other area where the armored car guards had, uh, had uh, shot their rooms. Agents believe that the gunmen who committed this attack were not the same ones who held up the MGM. The MO was not the same. In the investigator's experience, criminals rarely change their MO if it has worked in the past. FBI Special Agent Brett Shields. They were successful at MGM indoors, waiting for the guards indoor. The Desert Inn is outdoors, like they're trying to get the whole truck. Ten minutes after arriving at the scene, Agent Beasley gets a call that the getaway car has been found. I'll be right here. One of the uniform officers had been uh, patrolling the area looking for this vehicle, and we found it in the parking lot of a small motel. We looked inside, and we could see shell casings on the floor, and there was a 45 caliber shell casing on one of the running boards. Investigators also find an empty water bottle inside the vehicle. It is preserved in the hopes of recovering DNA evidence from it. Nearby, agents interview a man who says he saw the men who were driving the SUV. There was a witness there that had been walking his dog that had witnessed the exchange of the vehicle. One robber goes to the back of a pickup truck, simply throw a bag in the back, made a loud noise, what we think is the guns. The other two jump into the front of this pickup truck. Let's go, man, let's go, what's the matter? It's a key. The key doesn't work, man. Let's go. Go back. 
they were having difficulties actually getting the vehicle started. The witness then saw the two men frantically working on the steering column. He didn't know whether they were messing with it to hotwire it or what. Finally, the pickup roared to life and the men took off. Agents wonder why the robbers had to hotwire their own getaway vehicle. Presumably, they had placed the truck there ahead of time. So why didn't they have the keys? That was strange to us. We, didn't, we couldn't understand why that would have taken place. Then agents notice a pickup of the same make and model parked nearby. We thought maybe because there were two vehicles that were you know, very similar parked close together, they had jumped into the other vehicle, and of course their keys don't work, so they had to hotwire it. Agent Slump and I go back to the rear of this second pickup truck, and we notice that there's a license plate rubber banded over another license plate. The FBI runs the vehicle identification number on the pickup and discovers that it belongs to an ex-con named Pedro Duarte. The crime scene investigator finds fingerprints on the top license plate. Investigators run the prints and discover they belong to Duarte. This suggests that Duarte rubber banded the stolen plate to his own pickup. At the request of FBI agents, the witness agrees to describe the three men he saw to a police artist. Investigators hope that composite sketches will aid in identifying suspects. The next day, investigators travel to Pedro Duarte's house to ask him about his truck. So I had the composite with me. And when we, we go to knock on the door, and Pedro Duarte comes to the door, it's like, holy cow. Duarte bears a close resemblance to the man in the sketch. Mind if we come in and talk to you for a moment? Sure. When asked about his truck, Duarte insists that it was stolen. Police records show that it was, in fact, reported stolen. But that was hours after the attempted robbery at the Desert Inn. His story was that he and his wife had had personal problems, and he, so he went down just to walk the strip. So he had parked his vehicle and was just walking up and down the strip, and that he had fallen asleep on a bench. Duarte claims that when he woke up, his truck was gone. You know, just nonsense. N none of his story was true. He's just cocky. Cocky as cocky can be, man. Uh, his English was fine until we started getting to the harder questions, and then no hable. Duarte suddenly claims he cannot speak English. The Metro sergeant was even talking to him in Spanish, and he still claimed that he couldn't understand. It was a very frustrating interview. Discrimination. Investigators are convinced Duarte is involved, but are stymied by a lack of direct evidence against him. We still didn't have any answers. I mean, was he up to no good on the strip? Absolutely. Uh, could he have been doing jewelry robberies or snatch, purse snatchings or anything else and try to disguise his vehicle and this just be coincidental? Absolutely. Man, I don't know what you're even talking about, man. So we weren't comfortable enough to, to arrest him at the time. And we got nowhere with the interview. Hoping to get a positive identification on Duarte, Agent Shields shows a photo lineup to the only witness who has seen the faces of the Desert Inn robbers. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell. I just... And our witness did not pick him out of a photo lineup. 
So we had to go back to other means, trying to identify his associates, his money trail. Just a, kind of a full blitz on Duarte at that point. In an effort to gather any incriminating evidence against their suspect, investigators set up surveillance on Duarte. But after weeks of watching, they come up with nothing. The Mandalay Bay Casino, October 11th, 1999, four months after the attempted robbery at the Desert Inn. Two armed couriers pick up $88,000 and transport it to their armored truck. Suddenly, two gunmen ambush them. In the fall of 1998, two gunmen execute a brazen robbery inside Las Vegas's MGM Grand Casino, taking almost $350,000. Now, a year later, couriers collecting money at the Mandalay Bay Casino are under attack. Robbers quickly disarm them and flee with $88,000 in cash. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go. At the FBI's Las Vegas field office, agents review the surveillance video of the robbery. Special Agent Brett Shields suspects that the gunman who robbed the MGM committed this robbery as well. When we saw the manner of how this robbery had taken place at Mandalay Bay, there was a lot of similarities. The way the approach was made, the way the weapons were held, weapons in both hands, arms extended, and it did trigger some thoughts that the MGM and the Mandalay Bay are connected. I've been working on this for a long time. Investigators pour over the case, searching for any clue that might have been missed. Special Agent Richard Beasley. Brett Shields and I were in the office. We were talking about the case, what we could do to develop additional leads, uh, make sure all the leads that we had had been covered. And I'm looking over his shoulder, and I recognize uh, the name on there. The Goa is the watchman at the storage facility that detectives never got to interview. And at that time, it kind of lights went off for me that I told Agent Beasley, hey, this is actually Jose Vagoa then, you know, that's our guy. Jose Vigoa, who's that? Agent Shields has a history with Vigoa. I had arrested Jose Vigoa in 1990. That was a, one of the first arrests that I had made as an FBI agent. In 1990, the FBI was investigating Cuban immigrant Jose Vigoa for cocaine trafficking and went to a storage facility with a warrant to search his unit. As they're entering to go do the search, Jose Vagoa speeds away. An agent is standing in front of the gate, and he actually tries to run him over. That's his personality. You know, that's just the type of person that he is, that he's not going to be taken by the police without a fight. No respect for life or, or anybody but himself. Investigators checked Vigoa's storage unit and found a scale covered with cocaine residue and his fingerprints. He was later convicted of drug trafficking and assaulting a federal officer. He served six years in prison for his crimes. Shields remembers that Pedro Duarte was questioned in connection to the recent Desert Inn shootings. Duarte is Jose Vigoa's brother-in-law. To investigators, it now seems that the two robberies inside the casinos are connected to the attack outside the Desert Inn. They all appear to be the work of one group of robbers. 
agents decide to show Vigoa's probation officer the casino surveillance video to see if she can identify any of the robbers. The next day at the FBI office, Vigoa's probation officer watches surveillance tapes of both the MGM and Mandalay Bay robberies. She says one of the gunmen resembles Vigoa, but can't make a positive ID. Disappointed but undeterred, agents put Vigoa under surveillance. According to his probation officer, Vigoa earns only $10,000 a year and lives in a shack at the storage facility where he works. But Agent Beasley discovers that Vigoa actually lives in a middle-class house. We did financial background checks, and the house was, in fact, purchased just a few weeks after the MGM robbery. It was interesting to us because about $19,000 in cash had been put down on this house. The house was not purchased in Vigoa's name. It was purchased in the name of the person named Oscar Cisneros. Agents suspect Vigoa is using Cisneros as a financial front to hide his purchases. We knew after talking to Vigoa's probation officer that Vigoa was supposed to be working a, a labor-type job. He wasn't supposed to have much money. So if assets started showing up in Vigoa's name, that would certainly raise suspicion to his probation officer. Vigoa's finances are questionable, but they are not an indication of guilt. We didn't have the... Uh, any eyewitness identification of him in these robberies. And just because somebody's spending a large amount of cash uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they were involved in a robbery. If the goal was a convicted drug dealer, we didn't know if he was back in the drug trade, which would account for him having a large amount of cash. The results of the financial background check are not enough to move the investigation forward. We didn't have probable cause yet for, for any kind of warrant to, to go search Vigo's house or his property or his, or his vehicles. Uh, it, just, it just wasn't there yet. Even if we had even a minimal for a, a search warrant, uh, we may not be ready to, to actually do it yet. We want to develop a, additional so uh, we have enough to make the arrest and get a conviction, not just get enough for a, a search warrant for the house. Agents continue to watch Vigoa. Five months later, on March 3rd, 2000, in the neighboring suburb of Henderson, local police and the FBI respond to a report of an assault on an armored vehicle in front of the Ross Dress for Less department store. Two guards are dead. When we arrived, there was police tape up. Um, there was cars all over the place, witnesses were, were scattered, and there was the body of one of the security officers in the parking lot uh, next to the truck. It was a uh, not a good scene. Investigators worked to determine the series of events that led to the two deaths. We started interviewing people in the parking lot, uh, people in the surrounding businesses. A lot of people had heard the shots, some people had seen the shots, uh, some people had seen the, the vehicle driving away. Uh, everybody had a small piece to the puzzle that we were trying to put together. According to witnesses, around 11.15 a.m., an armored van parked in front of the department store. One guard went inside to pick up the store's deposit. Passing between two minivans, which witnesses reported seeing parked there since early that morning. The guard returned with the money. The gunman pounced. The courier drew his weapon and fired, hitting one gunman in the knee. But another gunman opened fire with an assault rifle. The guard died almost instantly. The gunman's fury was then leveled on the van's driver. The lead gunman grabbed the money bags. All three men made their escape in what witnesses described as a beige sedan. Their total take was less than $5,000. The amount of violence used in that, in that crime was just 
just uh, incredible. The, uh, the number of rounds that were fired and the, uh, the, the brutal cold-bloodedness that these, these security officers were killed was just uh, uncalled for. The details of the attack lead agents to believe this robbery was perpetrated by the same group they are currently investigating. The lying in wait, the attempt on the armored car, uh, the high power weapons, the, the, the shots fired, it all matched with the Desert Inn attempt. The crime scene technician processes the minivans used by the robbers, but he is unable to recover any evidence that could help identify them. As investigators continue working into the early evening, they experience a moment of unexpected and chilling sadness. When it's getting around 5 o'clock, cell phone starts ringing on the dead guard, and it was just a feeling that, of emptiness that, uh, that it's kind of every cop's nightmare, you know, that you're not coming home that particular night and then your wife or your significant other is calling, wanting to know where you're at and why you're not home. The phone kept ringing and everybody wanted to pick up that phone and talk on the other end. It was just a bad feeling. Investigators at the scene decide to join forces to track down the killers. We formed kind of an ad hoc task force within the FBI, Henderson Police Department, and Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department in order to identify the group of individuals who were doing these crimes. Everybody's goal was the same, to try to catch these guys. But without any evidence implicating their suspects, they will need to move quickly if they are to capture them before they strike again. In Henderson, Nevada, a group of heavily armed robbers continue their violent rampage with an assault on an armored van, killing two guards in a hail of gunfire. A few hours after the attack, police locate the robbers' abandoned getaway car in a parking lot. FBI Special Agent Henry Schlump investigates. We got there, we could see there was blood in the uh, driver's seat of the vehicle. Witnesses to the robbery had reported that one of the gunmen had been shot. A crime scene technician collects the blood as it may become valuable later as DNA evidence. Agents run the plates on the getaway car and the vans left by the killers at the scene of the robbery and find that they were all stolen from a rental car lot. The task force is unable to definitively identify suspects in the robbery but they are confident it is connected to a string of similar heists over the past 18 months. Those crimes have been tied circumstantially to ex-cons Jose Vigoa and Pedro Duarte, Vigoa's brother-in-law. But without any hard evidence implicating the pair, the investigation stalls. June 3rd, 2000. Three months after the Ross killings, the Bellagio Hotel and Casino. It's shortly after 6 a.m. Casino employees are counting money in the main cashier's cage. force frightened employees into a corner and then clean out the money drawers. Don't move. The robbers take over $144,000 in cash. But the gunmen are not finished. They want more. They target a nearby change booth. This time, the robbers allow the cashier to leave. They steal an additional $10,000. The security guard notices the fleeing cashier on a surveillance camera and zooms in for a closer look. The guard alerts outside security as he watches the robbers flee the building through an emergency exit. New York. The 
The robbers jump into their getaway van and speed off with more than $150,000. They're unaware that Bellagio guards in an unmarked van are following them and alerting police. However, once the robbers realize they're being followed, they react with violence. One bullet strikes the security van's tire. Ending the pursuit. Fortunately, none of the guards are injured. They provide police with the make, model, and license plate number for the vehicle. When FBI Special Agent Brett Shields hears the details of the heist and the robber's violent escape, he is convinced it is connected to their suspects. That shows the mentality of these guys that they weren't going to get taken. They were going to shoot it out. They were going to run. They were going to do everything they could to get away. At the Bellagio's security office, agents ask Jose Vigoa's probation officer to watch surveillance video of the crime, hoping for a positive ID. We showed the video, and she said, yeah, that was Jose Vigoa doing that robbery. Sure. I swear to it. This is the break agents need to bring in Vigoa. They obtain an arrest warrant, but they worry that this ruthless killer will not be taken down without a fight. In Las Vegas, the FBI has finally identified ex-con Jose Vigoa as the suspected leader of a violent band of robbers who has already killed two people. Agents obtain an arrest warrant for Vigoa and move to apprehend him. FBI Special Agent Brett Shields. They had a vehicle in front. The Metro SWAT team was going to pull up, exit the vehicle, and take him down at gunpoint. The SWAT officers got out and aimed their weapons at him. I pulled around the SWAT vehicle. He and I are, we're side by side. And uh, I'm actually showing him my credentials and, and he's acting like, who are we? And the vehicle in front of him wasn't close enough to his vehicle. So he was able simply to uh, pull out and to proceed. extremely dangerous, reaching speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour. The suspect refuses to slow even for a second. After a few miles, the Goa loses control of his vehicle and hits a tree. He exits the vehicle and flees. He's gone. He's f jumping over fences. He's going. Las Vegas SWAT officers chase after Vigoa while Agent Shields inspects the wrecked vehicle. To his surprise, he finds Vigoa's wife in the passenger seat. She's taken into custody, but is later released when investigators determine she was not involved in her husband's crimes. In the back seat, Agent Shields finds Vigoa's daughter. His wife is in the vehicle along with his little girl. Total disregard for them. Doesn't care that he's leaving them to face the police and all the weapons that's gonna be drawn on them. He's taking care of himself. SWAT officers finally catch up to Vigoa and take him down. I arrive. Uh, right as he's getting picked up. He's just 
arrogant. You can't touch me. I'm the man. So I said, well, we can touch you. And basically told him, this, it ends here. I mean, it's not, he's not going to see the light of day again. To ensure a conviction, agents need more proof. Armed with a search warrant, they enter Vigoa's house and find nearly $100,000 in cash, but no evidence directly connecting him to any of the robberies. With Vigoa in custody, FBI Special Agent Richard Beasley moves in on Oscar Cisneros, Vigoa's financial frontman. We need to talk with Cisneros about the assets that were in his name uh, being used by Vigoa. We identified ourselves and told him that Jose Vigoa had just been arrested for the Bellagio robbery and that we needed to talk with him about his relationship with Vigoa and these robberies that have been happening in Las Vegas. I told him that we also wanted to search his house and Oscar said, that's fine, I'll, uh, I'll talk with you and you can search my house. So right there on the hood of my car, he executed a uh, consent to search form uh, which gave us his permission to search his house. Investigators search while Agent Beasley and a Henderson detective question Cisneros. Look, I've known him for a We talked with Oscar about his relationship with Bigoa, about the the assets that had been put in Cisneros' name on behalf of Bigoa and where the money had come from in order to purchase those assets. Cisneros told us that he was just doing a friend a favor. It wasn't his money. But he wanted to help his friend out. Uh, we asked him if he had any contact with Vigoa in the last several weeks. He said, yeah, Vigoa brought over some money a few days ago. He didn't know where the money was from, uh, didn't know how much it was. Uh, and it was kind of in repayment for him being a good friend to put these assets in his name. Agent Beasley pressures him, but Cisneros says he knows nothing about any crimes. Again, he was very calm, uh, collected. He claimed not to know anything about anything. Uh, he was just trying to trying to you know work hard and pay his bills and, and support his family and and uh, just live a, a normal life. In the bedroom, investigators find a box full of cash. Suspicious, but not incriminating. A lot of hundreds, fifties, fives, tens. After searching for an hour with no results, an investigator on a hunch decides to search for any hidden compartments. I've got something here. And uncovers a mother load of evidence. Ammunition, body armor. Agent Beasley talks with the searchers. And he said, Rich, we found it. We found a secret compartment in his closet. Appears to have everything in it that's going to be what we're, we've been looking for. The agent needs to know if the items in the closet were used in the robberies. So I immediately went back where Oscar was sitting. I said, Oscar, we found it. We found your closet. What's going to be in there? He kind of sighed. He, he looked down. He said, the guns, everything. So at that point, I knew that he was going to be more of a player than what I, he, I thought he possibly could have been. The agent asks him about a scar on his knee. So tell me. And I could see the inside of his right knee, and there was like a puncture wound. I got shot. Shot? Where? At Ross. We were just ecstatic. We identified one of the people who had been shot at the Ross, and uh, we were well on our way to, uh, to solving that killing. 
How much time am I looking at? He started asking us what kind of penalty he was looking at, what kind of prison time. And uh, we were very honest with him. We told him, you know, we couldn't tell exactly for sure what he was looking at, but it could very well be the death penalty uh, because of the murders with the aggravated robbery. And he continued to ask us more about the uh, potential penalties. Why didn't you death penalty? I could, I could always uh, put in a good word for you. But, I mean, you know, you're going to have to help us out here. Eventually, he confessed to the Ross killings, the Desert Inn attempted armored car robbery, the MGM robbery, the uh, Mandalay Bay robbery, the Bellagio robbery. Okay, the lead guy is Jose Vigo. That's the lead guy. Based on Oscar's uh, confession, we learned that Vigo was the ringleader. He was the one who was organizing everything, deciding which which hits to do. Um, his Brother-in-law, Pedro Duarte, had been involved in the robberies uh, until the Desert Inn. After that, they brought in another individual, Luis Suarez, and he had taken part in the, uh, the Ross killing as well. I think Cisneros eventually confessed to us because he, he truly had remorse about what had happened, uh, not so much with the robberies, but with the killing of the armored car guards. As Cisneros continues to confess, Investigators process the evidence in the bedroom. They were taking each piece out, cataloging it, uh, making sure that nothing was disturbed as far as fingerprints or DNA type evidence. Toward the end of the search, they'd found uh, what appeared to be pipe bombs in there. They were four inch black PVC type pipes. Uh, with some type of circuit board attached to them. Investigators confront Cisneros about the bombs, asking if they are real. And Oscar said, no, not really. Didn't really give us a warm feeling that we can, uh, could rely on what he was telling us. He said, I'm going to ask you one more time, what are these things? He said, oh, we were just playing around. You don't, you don't really have to worry about them. It was that point, because of the vagueness of the answers, that we decided to go ahead and evacuate the house and uh, the, the surrounding neighbors. Agents take the evidence and abandon the house, leaving behind the pipe bombs. We called the bomb squad, and uh, they came in and, and uh, looked at the devices. They couldn't x-ray them because they were black PVC, and so they made the decision to go ahead and just explode them right there in the bedroom. Based on Cisneros' confession, investigators arrest Pedro Duarte for being the getaway driver at the Desert Inn. Pedro Duarte, what's your arrest? Investigators move to arrest the final robber, Luis Suarez, but he has fled the state. Ballistics experts test the weapons found at Cisneros' house and match them to bullets and shell casings from the Ross killings in the Desert Inn shooting. Experts also find critical evidence against Vigoa. We found Vigoa's fingerprint on one of the bullets inside one of the magazines uh, that was in Cisneros' closet. Prosecutors hold Oscar Cisneros at the Clark County Detention Center and intend to use his testimony at trial against the other robbers. We felt like it was a, it was a pretty tight package. We had Cisneros' confession. We had all the, uh, all the physical evidence for the, for the guns and the money and the clothing uh, that we found in the closet. So we felt like it was coming together very well. But one event would put the entire case in jeopardy. In Las Vegas, investigators have arrested three men connected to a violent robbery group. The leader, Jose Vigoa. His brother-in-law, Pedro Duarte. And Oscar Cisneros, who confessed everything to federal agents and implicated a fourth man, Luis Suarez, in the robberies. But on October 7th, 2000, 
The case weakens when Cisneros hangs himself in his cell. FBI Special Agent Richard Beasley. We learned later from the officers who investigated the suicide at the detention center that Vigoa had been sending messages up to Cisneros to do the right thing. Uh, I think that Cisneros didn't want to put his family through any more uh, problems and he just didn't want to deal with it, so he took the easy way out and killed himself. When Cisneros dies, his confession dies with him since it would be inadmissible in court. The prosecution team turns to forensic science to tie the other robbers to the crime. DNA evidence from the recovered water bottle and ski masks links Vigoa, Duarte, and Suarez to the crimes. The blood evidence recovered belonged to the now deceased Cisneros. While prosecutors prepare for trial, agents track down the remaining gunman, Luis Suarez, who fled Las Vegas and is hiding in Florida. FBI Special Agent Brett Shields. We went down to Florida, discredited all his alibis, and then he was ultimately arrested for this crime. In the fall of 2003, five years after their spree of robbery and murder began, Suarez, Duarte, and Vigoa go to trial in Las Vegas. Luis Suarez plea bargains to one count of armed robbery and receives a sentence of six to 15 years. Pedro Duarte takes his chances at trial and is convicted of two counts of attempted murder and other charges. He is sentenced to 16 to 70 years. In order to avoid the death penalty, Jose Vigoa pleads guilty to two counts of first degree murder and 44 other charges. He is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It took the combined efforts of three law enforcement agencies to bring this vicious gang of robbers to justice. This case was solved not by the FBI, but by the cooperation between the FBI, Henderson Police Department, and Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. It was just a great feeling uh, to be able to wrap up a case like this. Um, obviously, there were, there were many victims, not just the, uh, the security officers who were killed, but their families and the, the people inside the casinos and the, uh, the people who were traumatized watching these, these uh, armored car robberies go down and the casino robberies. There was a lot of people really shook up over this. And to, uh, to take these guys out of the, out of the mix was uh, a, a very good feeling. And the next time someone threatens the safety of the citizens of Las Vegas, local police and the FBI will be there to stop them.